This is the OGM check-in call on Thursday, June 23rd, 2022. Very nice to see everybody. Uh, Marshall, yay, glad you can join today. Fabulous. <clears throat> Marshall is a neighbor here in Portland and a fellow traveler, if I can reappropriate that term. Yeah. I forget what that used to mean. Uh, that used to mean you were a member of the Communist Party and Joe McCarthy had a little list with your name on it and he was coming after you and you were going to be doxxed and outed and ostracized and made impossible to work. And now it's a good thing. Kind of, yeah. So, and, so we, and while we can all appreciate the, uh, the phrase <laughs> from each according to their ability to each according to their need, the authoritarianism that came with that, uh, that paradigm is arguably unwelcome. Exactly. Um, one small thing in my brain, one of the effects of the blacklist, just because we're <coughs> doing this thing, one of the effects of the blacklist was that um, some of the writers became children's book authors. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. They were they were sort of pushed out. So the, I've got that under uh, the quirky advantages of prohibitions and persecutions. Hmm. Uh, the Quakers helped in launch the Industrial Revolution. Filmmakers moved to Hollywood to avoid Edison's patent persecution. Uh, AT&T AT was not allowed to commercialize Unix. Therefore, mm -hmm. we have the internet. Yeah. Uh, and blacklisted authors wrote children's books. So here's victims. Here's the Hollywood blacklist with uh, Trumbo, which is a good film, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. Jerry, on the unintended consequence of that, uh, put in a placeholder for cancel culture. Uh, so what's one of the unintended benefits of cancel culture? We don't know yet. I, I only need, I need, I need the insights. I'm hoping yeah, from your lips to God's ears that there's a I'm, silver I'm lining. To cancel culture. For something. I, was, I was just reading this morning, the, um, the CEO of Estee Lauder got, uh, after a long career in promoting diversity and black, uh, black talent and so forth, uh, just got fired off of one tweet, which is maybe right or maybe not. And it sounds like walking on eggshells to me. Yeah. Yeah. Not good. So the upside, if you need to list upside, is accountability, right? I'm not so sure. Uh, uh, mean, I'm not so sure that's accountability. Quickly, I just got here. Nice to meet y'all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure that's accountability. Right in, Marshall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is cancel culture? I mean, you, that's the the Republicans are using it the other way too. I mean, they, so. You know, the Billy Bragg article in The Guardian a couple years ago, like in defense of uh, so-called cancel culture uh, is uh, is a particularly notable resource. I don't have the one. Can the you other... put a link on the chat? I've got only the royalty scam under him. Okay. Yeah, and it, I saw you had David Bohm there too, but um, David Bohm probably would never have met or may not have met Krishnamurti if he hadn't been if McCarthy hadn't gone after him. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I like that. That's a good, uh, that's a good angle because uh, Bohm had to go to England to escape uh, being blacklisted and not being able to work. Didn't know that. Yep, yep. Um, well, there's just, there's just so many angles. I mean, I think the list of, of positive things that happened as a result of really terrible negative things, I, I, I would not be alive were it not for World War II. So there we it, go. It's like the old tale of the uh, old farmer and the white horse. Which we've heard mentioned on OGM calls. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, a couple of times. Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll the see. farmer and the horse. <laughs> um, so today is a, a check-in format. We just go around and I look at the little tiles on my screen. And uh, then every now and then somebody will drop something in the conversation that's like, whoa, wait a minute. And we'll, we might spend 20 minutes or a half hour on that one thing, which is okay. We don't always make it around the room. In fact, we seldom make it all the way through the check-in, but that's the way we roll. Uh, so today, uh, Scott, nice to see you. Although I'm not actually seeing you yet, but nice to have you on the call. Um, and Hank, yay. Yeah. Look, there's 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 the Scott himself. Did you all see that that Ohio State University has trademarked the word the? Mm -hmm. Because it's the Ohio State yeah. University. Yeah. I that that's my alma mater. So we are I'm long steeped in in that 
loans deep right, in, I, I, in, the in that questionable <laughs> value uh, proposition. You know, if it attracts attention, I mean, is that the? Is that it does. The, <clears throat> like, why would you? Why would you know that? Unless it, it attracts only, attention in some way, right? Only because it made Axios this morning. That's the only yeah. reason I, I've ever heard. Yeah, of it. I, it's it's an odd little triviality, and I don't think it's ever served any significant purchase other than to, you know, we're we're the the the. Yes. Who doesn't want to be the? But now nobody else can be the. The anything, apparently, because it's been trademarked. Oh, no, the Netherlands. Give me a break. <laughs> They're no longer the Netherlands. Now they've got to just be Netherlands because Ohio the, State has basically the taken Hague. the word. <laughs> it's just going to be Hague. <laughs> no, good point. Good point. The Philippines. Ah, sorry, oh, guys. Yeah, right. Oh, sorry. You do about the who. <laughs> oh, it's just going to be who, and then we're going to have all these who's on first kind of jokes about yeah. the who. <laughs> so Jerry, Jerry, stick this in the brain under what's wrong with the patent office. Uh, oh, I have overprotecting IP is a huge, I know, I know. huge nexus. Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so let's go. Let, let's uh, trot through our uh, our frame. Um, Trying to figure out who do who who do we miss last week? I forget because I don't remember who was on the tail of the distribution last week. Um, but let's go, um, Carl, Pete, Stacy. How about that? Actually, I'll defer for. I will put you later in the queue. How about that, Carl? Let's go, um, Pete, Stacy, Klaus. Uh, thanks, Trey. Hello, everybody. Um, I wanted to mention something that that Jerry and I have been talking about for a couple of weeks, and we thought it would be a good good thing to do as a little uh, side project work group thing. Um, uh, let me share my screen too. Uh, we wanted to, oops, wrong one. <laughs> um, uh, the the name we kind of came up with this for the, this concept is distributed accounting of value flows, and we we've made the observation that there are a few systems, Coordinate, Disco Co-op, Comagri, Open Collective, uh, that help you in the context of a community, uh, help you kind of uh, track and, and track, I guess, value flows. And I don't, we, we tried to explain why we thought tracking value flows would be a good thing. <laughs> I'm not sure that we've, uh, we've unlocked that, but, but we wanted to look at these different systems and and kind of make an assessment of them. Uh, so um, so I guess we propose that. Um, uh, I will make a uh, so our, our uh, the our, our intention is to have a first meeting, maybe an hour long, to kind of talk about uh, distributed um, accounting of value flows and why that might be a good thing, and then also how to. Uh, evaluate some of them, and then maybe break up, do some homework, and then come back together for another another one or two hour hour long call, something like that. Uh, so I'll post a crab fit um, uh, uh, to the chat and also to the uh, OGM Town Square channel, and uh, and we'll get going. Uh, hopefully, we'll meet sometime next week. Um, Gil, great question. What's the value flow? Um, I think that's TBD based on our on our talks together. Um, obviously, a value flow is like uh, something like uh, I'll help you paint the fence um, if you uh, uh, give me a couple of glasses of lemonade, uh, or um, uh, I'll make sure um, the videos and <laughs> one that one that uh, uh, is a burr under my saddle. Jerry is a saint, by the way, folks, uh, for making sure that calls get posted and stuff like that. It's a pain in the the rear. I do that for another couple calls, and it's just a pain. So um, are, so anyway, these are, so these are value exchange flows, not value flows. Value flows would be, I mean, like you know, greenhouse gas would be a, would be a value flow. Hugs would be a value flow. But if you want to trade something on them, that's a different thing, and it puts value into market. I'm not sure yeah. you only mean the exchange. Yeah. Ooh. Well, no, I, the, said, you do this, the, I'll do that. That's an exchange. The, the, that, was, that was one example. Were, that... were exchanges. Yeah. Um, we'd, we'd be more interested in tracking flows and maybe sinks and I don't know, whatever. But but anyway, 
Um, and, and I guess especially probably part of our, uh, it, it's a good observation, Gil, and part of our intuition that this is a useful thing is flows is probably a good thing to, tr to track, not just exchanges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Scott? Um, yeah, that, that's a really interesting exchange there. And um, I, I'm curious how one or either of you would would address me putting something out there hoping that i'm going to get something back and not sure what it is and then getting something back and being kind of surprised but also confirmed that oh well i i did this thing so so while i i do agree with you gil that that exchange seems more like okay yeah value exchange but what I'm wondering is when it's a non-specific exchange in the sense that I'm expecting to get something back, but I just don't know what that's going to be. And it's sort of positive intent, like, oh, I'm going to throw this out there. And I know and trust that somehow that's going to come back. And I'm curious how that fits in that definition. Yeah, so it's definitely something we, we want to, that's, that's something that I, well, Definitely something we want to like account for or or think of or or whatever. So I I wouldn't I would I would actually extend that a little bit. Um, uh, I'm going to put energy into the system, and I'm not going to worry too much. I'm not going to expect that I'm going to get something back, even right. And then maybe I get something back. Maybe I maybe I get more back. Maybe I, maybe I don't ever. Um, all of those kinds of things are I think worth thinking through and. Tracking seems like almost over one of the risks that Jerry and I wrote down really quick. As soon as you start tracking things, and as soon as you, especially when you start clapping things to tokens or money or something like that, you you take all a lot of the energy and love out of the the whole situation, right? So that's is a there's a caution, big caution flag for me there. But but at the same time, you know, and actually now that I think about it. Um, I'll, I wonder maybe a few of you, I, I tried to find it. Uh, we've got a list of, you know, coordinate uh, disco co-op, et cetera, et cetera. One of the, one of the experiments I know of um, back in the day, back, uh, I don't know, 20, 20 years ago, something like that, Pierre Amidiar of uh, eBay fame um, set up a really cool social network. Um, and, and a lot of it was just, it was, you know, not unlike OGM, a social network of people doing good stuff talking together on this cool platform that that Pierre created. And by the way, there was also a way that you could, um, you know, not surprising for the for the person who came up with eBay, there was a way, I forget exactly what it even was, but you could rank rank and rate stuff, you know, you got so many coins or tokens or, or stars or whatever for um, posting things and people would give you, you know, uh, some kind of in-game currency essentially. Um, that was all like noise to most of the participants. They thought they were in a social network doing good stuff like OGM. Um, at some point, the the curtain kind of, Pierre is a lovely person, by the way, so I don't mean any aspersions here, but, but in the course of things, there was a missed expectation. The curtain kind of got drawn back and Pierre's like, oh, thanks for uh, participating participating in my experiment of, you know, in-game social currency. Everyone's like, in-game? This is my life. What the hell were you, you know, I, I wasn't playing a game, dude. You know, this is not cool. So I, I think that used to be called uh, Omidyar Network. That's also the name of his charitable uh, foundation. So anything you search on Omidyar Network now has got a bunch of good works that Omidyar and Omidyar Network is doing. Anyway, I, I also wanted to recall that because... It was a really early example of, you know, um, we're doing this all with good intent and, oh, there's a game underneath and, oh, it's not fun anymore for anybody. Nobody was uh, happy about that. Um, Pete, good explanation of that. Gil, I'll get to you in one sec. Um, and I'll just add that I was sort of one of the early people into that network. And then what ha would happen was the number of points other people had given you would show up in parentheses after your name, wherever you went. So wherever your handle was, there was a little parentheses with a number and that tiny thing was a real turnoff for me. So I basically stopped going in there and had other stuff to do, but I wasn't, I wasn't interested in being in a community where my rating, even if it was like, Oh, Jerry's great. Like points, points, points. 
I wasn't interested in being there when that was so explicit. And it was just a design decision. It was really just a little simple design decision that was a big turnoff for me. But but it did kind of blow up uh, in their faces. Uh, Gil, you stepped away and you stepped back. Excellent. Please, floor sure. is yours. Yeah. Uh, so I asked two different questions. And I want to distinguish them. Uh, my first was purely informational. What what are you meaning by value flows? Because it wasn't clear to me. Uh, and I, you know, I suspected the word could mean many different things and wanted to get some clarification on it. Uh, Pete, the first example that you gave was one of, of an exchange circumstance. And that's and that triggered the second question, uh, which is basically about. Well, let me let me let me put it as a as a as an interpretation rather than a question. Um, it 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 struck me as a um, a really interesting example of how captured we are by the frame of capitalism, and markets as the basis of all human behavior. And if you know we've been reading Wengro and 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 Graeber, who really challenged that as a fundamental of human affairs. But we even here, even in this group, even in this conversation, it's sort of a default assumption. And I want to I want to question that, uh, and and invite the conversation about value flows to to note that, uh, open a much broader conversation about value flows and then see the market and exchange phenomena as one aspect of that, you know, where it's useful. So my own- I totally agree. Um, and self-reflectively, the, so, the reason I would like quickly go if, in a quick explanation of something, tell me about value flows. Yeah. Just, yeah. just and not, not because I think they're, not that I think markets are the best thing, but in conversations with folks, that's the one where people go, oh, I get it. Okay. Um, so I've learned to talk about value flows in uh, as, as a market exchange kind of thing, just because otherwise you have to have a long conversation about, oh, I can put value into a system and never expect something back. Or or we have a, uh, we have a, I, I was, I'm trying to grab a, gra a good example out of Don of everything and I'm going to fail. But, but anyway, you know, there's a bunch of different ways cultures work um, and gifts go around the system. Yeah. And it's not, a, you know, it's not a, you give me this, you give me this and I'll give you that thing. I, I totally agree, Gil. Thanks. Thanks uh, for yeah. that bookmark. Yeah. And just a couple, a couple of more points on that, Marshall. Um, before you move on, Gil? You know, I'm on the same thing, not moving on. Okay, keep going. Finish that up. Yeah, I just want to note Marshall's comment about, you know, mapping energy flows in Qigong or in acupuncture. I mean, my acupuncturist looks at the flows. She's not doing any kind of exchange thing around them. She's doing balancing and other interventions. So there's that. Uh, Pete, to your question about how to talk to people about this, um, did a, a workshop years ago with the great Howard T. Odom of, of energy systems modeling <laughs> fame, not enough fame, I think. Uh, and it was a remarkable uh, pedagogical experience because every it was a very diverse group, multidisciplinary group of academics and business people and so forth. And everybody, every time somebody asked him a question, he would immediately ask them who they were, where they worked, what they did, what their training was. And it, start, it, it, it first felt kind of offensive and condescending. But what it was is that he was calibrating his answer to their language and their framework. And so, you know, uh, what you're doing is, you know, you're responding appropriately to some folks. It didn't land right for me. And uh, so listening to the language that someone is listening to you in may be very helpful because what you, you're, you're grabbing a very complex tiger by the tail here. And I want to encourage you to, to hold the doors open, not let them reduce too quickly. And I just wanted to come back, Gil, and say that uh, I'm going to disagree with your your opening premise a moment ago that we're immediately taking the framing of capitalism. I think you're talking into a group that's trying to figure out how to puzzle on the big the, the bigger nut. Uh, I, and, I love and, that. Yeah. Well, but you didn't introduce your question that way at all. You introduced it in a way that made my little radar go wah, wah, wah. <laughs> okay. Um And and so like like I think being charitable <laughs> to this group is. Yeah. How how might we best tackle the big questions here? Because like Grace has been opening conversations with us about like what's a world without money look like, and th those are all great and interesting questions. And now we have software that can model kind of anything, mm -hmm. and I think we're pretty conscious of the ways in which money poisons relationship and trust and other sorts of things. Uh, and and so I think this is a huge uh, Pandora's box of of issues, and I would love to figure out how. To how to pick this this issue apart in some interesting systematic way, how to leave artifacts online in the big fungus that represent our insights about this process, and how to generalize the process so that because a piece of this process is, hey, should OGM and Meta and everybody else be using one of these platforms? I mean, the the, the question starts with, hey, should we move on to a platform so that we can track 
flows of energy, value, goodness, whatever. Yeah. Um, and so there's also, I think there's a pattern in here to, to extract and, and make visible, and maybe somebody else has already done this, about how to do those comparisons really well. For sure. And look, I, 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 mm. I love this group and I love that this investigation is going on. I don't didn't mean in any way to diss it. My first question was in fact curious. Uh, but when the first example came up as a market example, my little radar guy is going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally understand. Makes sense. Like that. So that's it. Thank uh, you, uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Margaret. <laughs> please jump in. If I may throw in, you know, the thought of everything perspective here, markets are as old as um, the first formation of people living together and splitting their labor. So how do you pay the blacksmith you know, so he can buy food? Uh, and in, in exchange for his labors as a blacksmith. Uh, and so the, the, there had to be an exchange of values in, in ways that allowed the trading of goods and services. Maybe. And on top of that came ever more complex systems uh, of monetary uh, uh, valuations and so on and so on. And those have gotten us into trouble. It's not the basic exchange of goods and services that needs to have some structure to it. Um, Mr. Kirkpatrick, you put an interesting comment in the chat, and then I'd like to go to Doug and then, uh, sorry, uh, Doug Carmichael and then Doug Breitbart. But Marshall, if you want to jump in and talk about uh, the uh, counter examples on Dawn of Everything. Yeah. So I was just typing into the chat, uh, following uh, immediately after the previous thing, a broader category that encapsulates uh, exchange and markets. Uh, that being a uh, pursuit of sustenance, uh, that I, I know I, I, I'm collaborating with a, a contemporary global indigenous organization called cultural survival, uh, that, uh, I, I was surprised to hear, uh, talk about money as, uh, as quickly as they did when I spoke of a, a collaborative partnership, uh, but who quickly reframed that as, as, uh, acquisition pursuit of sustenance, you know, for, uh, for, for family and loved ones. Um, but uh, two critiques of Dawn of Everything that, that, uh, that, that come to my mind are first, uh, doing a, a programmatic search of thousands of contemporary uh, indigenous uh, people on Twitter and publishing on the web. Uh, I was surprised as I read the book to find zero discussions of Dawn of Everything uh, by contemporary indigenous people. Uh, and it was uh, only after getting a little creative with my search queries that I found uh, Estes, uh, what's Estes' his first name? I can't remember. Uh, author of the book, uh, Our Past is Your Future. Uh, really interesting book, uh, being uh, very snarky, uh, making some snarky references to uh, treating uh, contemporary indigenous people as an afterthought. Uh, and and uh, Graber and, and his co-author uh, essentially uh, exploiting that, uh, you know, having a having a an inequitable uh, relationship with agency and in contemporary indigenous communities. Uh, uh, second uh, critique was uh, I I was quite taken aback uh, that uh, the work of uh, Maria Gambudis uh, was a footnote, a tiny footnote uh, in that book. And, uh, and upon uh, searching on YouTube, found an amazing hour-long video uh, produced by Starhawk, narrated by uh, Dukakis. What's, uh, can't remember the- Olympia. Olympia Dukakis, uh, mm -hmm. discussing the, the groundbreaking work of the Lithuanian American anthropologist, Maria Gambudis, uh, unearthing and interpreting really, uh, I think in a compelling way, uh, archaeological prehistory around a matrifocal uh, European lineage uh, in a way that, that was at first uh, welcomed with great accolades and then subsequently uh, marginalized and uh, sure seemed like it warranted more than, uh, than the footnote I, I thought that it got in uh, Dawn of Everything. Uh, thanks for bringing our attention back to Maria Gambudis. I've forgotten she was in here and need to go back and learn about it. And there's the Kurgan hypothesis. I think that's part of what she's talking about. Sorry. Um, yeah. Whoop, so, whoop, team goddess worship. 
<laughs> um, Doug C, Doug B, Pete. I think we could have a really fruitful conversation about what capitalism is uh, by having a separate conversation at some point in the future. About what capitalism is? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think we, we have enough historical evidence to, to make some really critical points. So, for example, that capitalism begins with the birth of new cattle uh, in uh, early cultures, and that surplus uh, broke the existing meaning of what was whose and became a problem. And the word capital, of course, comes from cap, which is head, which goes back to a new head of the cattle. And it's an amazing thing. I mean, if you say about capital, it's simply the surplus is produced by a society that unfortunately ends up being owned by some of the people in that society and not all of them. And that's the modern conundrum. But I think we could really make some progress. Thanks, Doug. And there's a lot of really good, uh, there's a rich trove of, of, of stuff there worldwide. Um, Doug B. Yeah, I um, as is my sort of center of gravity to go to like fundamental ingredients. And so the the inquiry of, of value flows um, and, and value um, representations and capitalism and all of that, um, there's sort of an underlying intrinsic question of what is value and how are we defining um, whether we're defining value as in service to contribution to uh, the collective, the whole, um, or whether we're defining value as a noun um, versus a contribution. So um, just throwing in two cents for backing up maybe to the underlying question of you know what have we can what what have we attached the value uh, rubric to from a meaning standpoint, and more importantly, going forward, what might we want to attach the rubric of value to going forward, uh, in service to doing it differently? Did I mention that this topic is like a Pandora's box that unfolds <laughs> and unpacks into kind of everything? Yeah, I might have said that, but I like totally agree, Doug. And and I think what we what we might find is that there's little pieces of this that have to spawn out and come back and say, hey, here's a here's a summary of capitalism, here's a summary of value, and here's how they we think they fit. Or maybe we just drag this out and do it in one sequence. I don't know, but I think that that we're trying to start start this this sequence of conversations together. Um, uh, Pete, back to you in the booth. Thanks, Jay. Um, I, I wanted to thank Marshall. Thank, thank you, Marshall, for uh, your um, your two critiques of, of Dawn of Everything. Um, as one of the people participating in the book club, I, I tried to get my wife, or I asked my wife if she was interested in, in joining the book club. She got about a, a chapter and a half into the book, and she's, she she uh, threw it down and um, and was angry at me for uh, a, a couple days afterwards because it's written from a man's point of view and the, the women are are but footnotes uh, in it uh, and and she's like Pete, dude, it says dawn of everything here right there in the title and I'm not in this book and you know what the f? She was royally upset and I had a really hard time defending that because uh, it's totally true. <laughs> um, having said that, uh, uh, and in conversations later, um, my, my wife has left the book far behind. It's like, I'm not gonna have anything to do with it, which I, I res totally respect that um, uh, um, uh, decision. Um, we, we have still found the book to be um, practical and useful and interesting and, and valuable, um, even uh, even despite its uh, its flaws. You know, so it's not a perfect thing, but it's a very valuable thing. Um, and there is some there is a, later in the book. There's some good talk about um, women in the systems of of society, um, uh, not not just men. So. Um, so thanks, Marshall. I, there's another big critique, which is not just uh, Maria Gambutis is missing, but all women are missing, kind of. Um, and it's still a good book, uh, if, if flawed. Um, Pete, that was just your first check-in item. Did you have a couple other things you wanted to check in with? 
<laughs> no, that's, I'm good for today. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I've lost track of my cue, which looks Thank like Stacy Klaus Scott. Wow, so that's a lot to absorb. And I it was hard because I was so conscious that I was next up in the queue. <laughs> so what I came here with was um, some of the things that were happening in the email thread. And I know that, um, I know Gil, you had put one of them in, which was the comparison of social media and um, a cult. And then there was something else that was put in, and I hadn't even had a chance to read the threads, but I did put a quote that Daniel um, Tobisi, is that how you say his last name? Um, and he said, one can be a showman, even a crook, an occasional liar, and still have a correct and in-depth understanding of a context. But no, many of us are way too limited mentally to accept shades of gray and prefer to depict our enemies in absolute terms. And he went on to say how that's going to kill us. And that that really stood out for me because that's something that we can all do something about individually in our lives. And in the um, chart that Gil put in, it talked about leaving social media. And I'm a person, I go down with the ship. And I have no intention of leaving something if there's any hope of making it better. Now, if I can't make it better, or if a person can't make it better, then I think they should leave. But I think there's something to be said in this idea of not only do we have to learn to see shades of gray, but particularly when our enemies have thoughts that we would otherwise embrace and we're pushing them away. Um, and kind of related, but not, there was, um, it's something separate. There's a series of um, by Wynton Marsalis at Harvard. Music is a metaphor. Highly, highly, highly recommend. And with that, I'm complete. <laughs> um, there's a term that Adam Grant uses, complexification, uh, which um, is a nice way of unpacking the places where you and someone who disagrees with you might find agreement. So instead of saying that some issue is large and binary, uh, rather than sort of un complexifying and unpacking the issue and then discovering that there's a bunch of places where like, like yeah, 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 in this corner, we're completely of, of like mind. It's over here that we have a very different opinion. And, and we don't slow conversations down enough to do that. We don't have a standing memory to remember we did that and not go back over and over again to the superficial level of the binary conversations and arguments. We're being fanned uh, into overheating and staying at the top level and keep going at that level. Uh, so it makes it all hard to, to come down and, and do that, that subtle work of, of picking through the issues. Go ahead, Stacey. Yeah, I'm speaking even more to the extremes because I'm talking about people, especially on social media. Like one of the things that in the chart, you know, Gil talked about is, you know, the way they mislead things, you know, these memes come at us. Well, I've seen people here, including myself in the past, do the same thing. So we have to hold ourselves accountable. I have to watch the way I word something, you know? So yeah, it, it's more than just um, what's obvious. It's even, you know, it, it's, it's, I've been attacked so many times for entertaining the possibility that somebody I don't like has something worthwhile to say. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. Um, Klaus Scott Marshall. Yeah, that was a very fair statement, Stacey. It's, it's uh, <clears throat> I mean, it's so hard to, to uh, move beyond our reflexive uh, 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 emotional context, context here. So as you know, I'm, I have a one track mind focused on food and agriculture. <laughs> and uh, I really appreciate these conversations here to get me to diversify and spread out a little bit more. And which is also why I like our dawn of everything conversations a lot, right? Because uh, they really, uh, they really um, 
enrich you know the way you think about stuff but i saw something this morning that i thought really sort of captures the moment can i share, share the screen for a moment yeah go ahead um, yeah so i thought this graphic here is just so awesome and the discussion that comes out that came out of it when you look beyond beyond right it's just wonderful and the question is, are we in the oops or at the fuck moment? This is really what, what the conversation here boils down to. And uh, when, you, when you read what, what, uh, what people write here, um, most, mostly, mostly agreement that we are most likely beyond the oops uh, and, and we're already in what we could, could, could consider deep do that, right? And <clears throat> I'm, I'm in a... Uh, number of conversations with different NGOs, and um, these are people who are who are in the know, right? I mean, they they understand the issues, they understand the uh, um, uh, not the the dynamics of the system. They watch the news. You now, right now, you have major flooding in Bangladesh. When you see those pictures, it's just it's just stunning how a significant part of Bangladesh is just flat underwater. South China, you know, the Guangzhou region is uh, having massive flooding. Uh, and yet in other regions, you know, you're drying up and drying out. And so the uh, impacts of the slowing Gulf Stream uh, is already being felt. And that is at risk of collapsing. You know, I mean, with the Arctic ice reducing more than reducing the power of these uh, sea currents. Um, there is a real risk. If you have seen that, that video that uh, scientists who explained how the introduction of fresh water in addition to warming oceans could bring this to a drastic stop, which would change everything. It would be absolutely global catastrophe. Um, and so, <laughs> I'm, I mean, these conversations where, you know, people who are working on, on uh, educational material on lobbying Congress and talking with uh, uh, members of Congress. And they are not in the fuck moment, they're still in the oops moment. You know, they are, they, we need to really accelerate there where we are at this fine line of consciousness, of conscious awareness, because the moment we go beyond the oops line, then you really have to do something, right? Because now you have to protect yourself. And I don't know how, how to get a, um, you know, there's always this, this percentage of people, the early adop adapters versus people who then join later. I don't know where we are, to be very honest, but I have a dumb feeling that we're not where we need to be to catch anything and to make an impact. So I'm sorry if I bring everybody down again, but that's sort of the, the, um, what prevents me from sleeping well, you know, because I constantly have these uh, thoughts going through my mind and, and visualize, you know, I mean, unfortunately, my mind wants to visualize how this is all unfolding and it's not pretty. Thanks, Carl. Agreed. Um, unfortunately, your, the first comic you showed reminded me of the avocado ripeness stages cartoon. Mm -hmm. Where it's like not ripe, not ripe, not ripe, not ripe, not ripe. Oh fuck, too late. Um, that's kind of the the road we seem to be on. Uh, Scott Marshall Hank. Uh, sorry, Carl had his hand up. Let's go there first. Carl, if you want to unmute and jump in. There yeah. You go. So um, let's see. This paste works now. Yeah. Yeah, um, there were two things actually. The discussion that Stacy was bringing up, uh, Stacy and Doug have heard me talk about it before. I haven't got any traction, but Peter Elbow wrote, it was in a couple of books, and then there's this article and stuff on the believing game. But basically, uh, the um, the scientific method is, he framed, says the doubting game. And there's, he advocates for a methodological way of seeking validity in things you don't agree with, um, basically. So it's a complement to 
the traditional scientific method, which people refuse to talk about. I mean, you, we have a lot of, um, there's a lot of bias in there that, that um, and things that um, people have. And then the, the other link, uh, other people might have seen it. I did share it with a couple people on the call, but there's um, talking about this guy's done some analysis about how, about um, has a framework about how to um, analyze the effectiveness of communication using some of Jane Goodall's speeches and stuff too. But I think they're kind of connect, connected and how do you, uh, it's like the believing game challenges the prevailing paradigm so much you can't even get people to can you describe it. Can you describe the believing game a little bit more so we get a little bit more traction on it? It uh, sounds really interesting. Yeah, it's um, yeah. So ba yeah, basically, as um, as I said, it's, um, well, people. I think one of I think one of the things is people were in that either or mindset, and it's and and things. So people think you're questioning um, the hegemony of the scientific method and um, and things so it, but it's really a compliment basically saying that the scientific method is incomplete and um, things so as I said I've I just had it pop up on Facebook memories that I had posted about it like 12 years ago <laughs> I mm -hmm. have yet to have anybody really um, engage in a conversation about it. So this, I think, is the right community to kind of take a take a look at it and see what people think. Thanks, Carl. Um, appreciate that, Mr. Carranza. Did you want to jump in on the thread where we are? I'm sure. I'm reminded of um, an essay by the American pragmatist, uh, mid-century philosopher, or you know, uh, at the 1900s. Um, so last century philosopher um, Charles Henry Peirce who wrote that the businessman has to believe in order to act. Actions come from belief. The scientist doubts. And in this hilarious notion that the scientist is willing to leave his body on top of the other corpses, but a little higher up the pile of corpses to the gate of truth mm -hmm. so that other doubters can <laughs> climb a little further. That's about it. Um, uh, doubt is central to uh, um, his version of the scientific method and his philosophy was fallibilism. That scientific knowledge is always fallible. But there is a community process to basically come to temporary agreement on um, what, should be work, what should be worked on, what should be acted on. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have fallibilism in my brain. There's an ism missing, damn it. Damn it, you've stumped the band. I hate that. Um, thank you. Uh, Scott Marshall Hank. Hmm. Um, hmm. Let's see. Well, Stacy, you mentioned a book on music. This has been my favorite book on music hmm. uh, as of late. It's a, a neuroscientist who was a record producer. Hmm. And it's a fascinating little, it's one of those things that we all sort of take for granted in sometimes that we all enjoy music, but why? You know, it's, it's, it's unlikely that a combination of pitches and rhythms would have such a profound emotional effect universally. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you find someone who really does not enjoy music, they tend to be really on the edge of that bell curve in some sense. Or androids. Maybe this yeah, is what, it's, they, it's, maybe this is what they should have been using in Blade Runner. <laughs> but yeah, you, well, that's, that's an interesting, I hadn't really thought about that as I follow some of the AI progressions just very loosely, you know, are they going to be enjoying music? Who knows? Um, yeah, not just analyzing, but actually drawn to. So, all right. Um, I have a call coming. I will get back to you in a minute. Thanks very much, Scott. 
Um, Marshall Hank Eric. Hi. Uh, so first time caller, right? Uh, and attendee. What, uh, what, what can I do for you? I, I'm next on the queue. We're, we're checking in. So our, our rhythm is uh, what is happening in your life that's OGM -y, OGM related, any of that kind of stuff, and just throw it in the mix uh, and we see where it goes. That's about it. Nice. Uh, and your, your life appears to be one large OGM ob uh, object. So uh, I think that you could scratch anything and we'd be interested. Thanks. What a fun group this is, man. Nerd time power hour. I'm loving it. Uh, thank you so much for the, the invite. Uh, so I, I've got uh, three things I am working on. Uh, I, I'm curating the weekly uh, climate good news, the pragmatic optimism section of the Exponential View email newsletter. Um, I am building with a team a, a climate news aggregation community uh, that we hope to launch this fall in partnership with uh, Exponential View, Cultural Survival, Indigenous Groups, and now Climate Base, uh, Climate Jobs site. Um, and then uh, for my day job, I just joined Thomas Gieselman's uh, venture capital fund called Headline VC, uh, who was uh, one of the first investors in Delicious years ago. Uh, and I'm building news aggregators there uh, for, for them. And throughout those projects, one of the, the uh, OGM angles might be uh, that I, I'm finding a, a, a lot of value from unlocking uh, archival knowledge to contextualize uh, any given day's news events. So for example, on Exponential View last week, we covered the uh, first opening of offshore wind auctions in India uh, this week. And uh, we're able to contextualize the scale, which is massive, uh, by referencing previous stories of the largest wind auction uh, generation uh, in the United States that occurred a few months ago and the largest single wind uh, energy production facility in the UK, uh, in the world that's in the UK that launched uh, just a, a bit ago as well. And I, I have only, you know, light, uh, systematic ways of contextualizing that I numbers are can be hard so I've got a running list of any any uh, scale of uh, you know gigawatt renewable energy production uh, that I'm just adding to in Rome research so that I could go back and contextualize any new number that I see uh, with others but it feels like that's just scratching the surface of uh, of unlocking value add through uh, efficient contextualization of, of emerging news. Um, there's a request in the chat to put a link to that so we can uh, follow you. Sounds really super interesting. Thank you. Thanks. Um, let's go Hank Eric Gill. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this has been a great conversation so far, but rather than picking up any of the threads about value and values, and uh, and uh, capitalism. And so let me just check in with something I've been concerned with for the last uh, couple of uh, couple of weeks and months. As uh, a number of you know, I went to uh, uh, Stockholm for the Stockholm Plus Fifty and the uh, World Environment Week activities, and I proposed to a lot of people starting an initiative about uh, conversations about mid-century, what's the world that we want to live in in three decades? Uh, it should be a multi-generational dialogue about climate change and an international dialogue about climate change. And uh, it was quite well received by a lot of interesting people in Stockholm. And now, uh, even though it's the summer or maybe because summer is a good time to do this, uh, we're looking for partners who are interested in contributing in very different countries. Uh, we've got people in Sweden, the Netherlands, Spain, and Japan uh, interested so far, but love to get people in Africa or Latin America involved. We're looking for people to design immersive experiences uh, 
to frame these conversations about the next three decades. And at the moment I'm talking to a number of uh, emeritus uh, people from the Los Alamos labs, but I think a lot of people on uh, OGM who uh, know of people who design immersive experience uh, might be interested in this. And uh, very specifically, uh, since I'm meeting people tomorrow who work at the European Space Agency, uh, and I did meet four people working in the uh, European Space Agency uh, type of projects in Stockholm, we're trying to look at how to use space and observing the Earth from space and uh, astronauts and uh, newly launched telescopes as a kind of strange attractor to get people of all ages uh, interested in thinking about and talking about the world they want to live in the next 30 years. So that's also putting things out to the OGM community. Uh, and it might be an interesting conversation at another time for people within OGM about uh, how to get people involved in actively thinking and talking about the futures they want and how to get those voices uh, heard by uh, the so-called decision makers in the world. That's my chicken. Thanks, Hank. Um, just out of curiosity, when asking somebody to envision the world 30 years ahead, what from the work you've done on this, and you've been on this for a long time, what what questions draw out the best answers? What 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 kind of what can you ask or do or say or create that gives you really generative answers? Well, I like to frame the whole conversation in terms of uh, uh, being a victim or being a builder, uh, and I like to say, well, I mean, it's easy to sit back and say, well, uh, I'm just a victim of those people up there, the elite, the powerful, the rich, uh, who decide everything for us. And it's easy enough to say, uh, well, uh, I think uh, the, the president of the United States or the president of China or uh, the Queen of England uh, or the Pope in Rome, they have the authority to do these things. And I say, well, you know, if you leave it for them, you're also going to be a victim, however much you might respect the Pope or the Queen of England. And I'm being a little facetious here. Just a uh, wee bit. A wee bit. If, uh, if you don't take some responsibility of thinking, for yourself what you want, you'll never get there. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, was it the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland who said, uh, well, if you don't know where you're going, you'll always get there. But I don't think there's anyone on this call and I don't think there's anyone in OGM who's going to say, well, I don't want to just get anywhere. And I think that's true for millions and millions of people throughout the world, both uh, young people in their teens and youngers, but even, even people in their 70s and 80s who say, well, uh, it's maybe time to, uh, to think, actually, where am I going? Where do I want to go? Uh, so it's a framing issue that tends to bring it out. And depending on the group and who you're working with, you can ask very specific questions. But the framing I've found so far is really important. Thanks, Hank. Um, Klaus? Yeah, thank you, Hank. And also, Marshall, you know, I mean, everyone is working on such amazing uh, projects focused on uh, catching climate change and dealing with the environmental degradation around us. I'm just talking about timing. I was in a meeting yesterday that was organized by the Sierra Club, you know, a legal uh, team there with a group of activists who are challenging the idea of rights of nature. So does the river have a right to exist, for example? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so that was a pretty lengthy discussion until I started to ask you know, a simple question. When you think about the legal process, to sue you know, at the United Nations, you know, in the United States, you sue for rights of nature, you're talking about years, right? And then let's say you win. There are tons and tons of laws and regulations on the books that no one pays any attention to that were bitter fights you know, over years of uh, climate activism and they're not being enforced, they're not being funded, they're not being done with. I said, why wouldn't you 
shorten your time frame. And I think this is what this, the graphic that I was showing, the difference between oops and, and, and fuck, right, really is what are you focusing on that has immediacy in results. You know? And so if you focus on the farm bill, that's a discussion on the way right now. You know, the United States government is spending billions of dollars of taxpayer money that influence the direction of how agriculture is being, is being conducted, right? I mean, the industrial form of agriculture wouldn't be possible if the government didn't spend billions of dollars doing it, screwing up our water, you know, screwing up our soil and what have you. So the, the, I think that we, we, we are at a point where we have to think about timelines and, and, the, and with the need of immediacy you know, in, in impact. And even with, you know, in a meeting like this yesterday, I mean, passionate environmentalists, you know, really dedicated to doing what they're doing, but focusing on things that are further out. So every time you read, you know, by 2050, the sea level will rise. Well, what does that mean? No, the sea level is rising right now, you know? And so you have to deal with it right now. And so we have to change the language that we're using to describe these events. And that instantly brings out conflict, right? Because when you, when you, when you point out the immediacy of our scenario, of our situation, that means we are asking for change. And that has been running into you now 40 years of, of, of pushback and it's intensifying. And so timing, I think we need to really say, this timeline is just wonderful, right? Uh, between oops and, and for where are we? We are at, at best on the threshold. It's a wee bit demoralizing, I will add. However, <clears throat> it, it, it should motivate some urgency, but yeah, that, that's a scary, I mean, that is how we're treating things. Um, thank you, Pops. Uh, if I uh, may, can I, Jerry, do you mind if I do a quick response to that? Mark, good. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Marshall, then Mark. Thanks. Uh, so I, I met yesterday with a, a, a leader at the UN in uh, climate adaptation with a new focus on foresight, uh, who said that his foresight group in particular <clears throat> uh, was, uh, actively looking for blue swan events, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, could facilitate, uh, a, a rapid tipping point, uh, in a 10 year or less time frame, uh, towards, a, a, a global shift towards hyper-local economies, uh, et cetera. And I, I thought that was, uh, it was an appropriate, uh, framing relative to this. The, the previous comment is um is blue swan event like a magical unicorn kind of wishful thinking or is blue swan event a really interesting way to frame the hunt for leverage in the right places to solve these things you know you me and google would all like to know a little bit better but my my understanding of how he uh intended it was you know if uh if a gray swan is we're pretty sure it's going to happen we just don't know when uh, then a, a blue swan is uh, uh, an, an intentional, I, I took it to mean a, an intentional uh, time uh, undetermined but, uh, but prompted transformative event. And large, so like a, I like, think the swans in general are very large transformative events, just the way we're yeah. metaphorically working this. Um, interesting. So it's this, so it's kind of borrowing blue ocean strategies or whatever else, mixing that in with black swans, which turned into gray swans. We're friends with Michelle Wooker, who wrote The Gray Rhino, <clears throat> which is the completely well understood thing that's facing you across the field that nobody's dealing with. That's The Gray Rhino. The Gray Rhino has been repurposed into lots of different things, is a very popular concept. It turns out in China, <clears throat> like China loves uh, The Gray Rhino and is all over it. Uh, BTS has uh, sung a song that where they mentioned The Gray Rhino. <laughs> uh, that's, that's some form of fame, right? Um, Mr. Carranza. Um, from Hank, um, one of the 30 year questions. I have a friend, Betsy Burroughs, probably a lot of people know her. Um, at 70, she uh, encountered advice to create her next 25 year plan and said it was incredibly transformative. And I don't know what question, but uh, certainly she writes a lot about these things. Um, um, and I'd like to find out more about, uh, about that <laughs> as I yeah. approach 60. 
Cool. Thank you. Yes. Um, let's go, Eric, Gil, Doug Carmichael. Yeah, hi, everybody. So I'm going to pick up on the topic of music. So um, in my personal exploration, um, I put in the, the chat a video that I made last week where I was connecting songs like Irving Berlin's Blue Skies to cultural references, like Al Jolson sang it, and it's in Star Trek. Is this and like the riff off in Pitch Perfect? I don't know what... Oh my God, you don't know the riff off? I will post a link yeah, to post the riff something. off for you. <clears throat> you yeah. will like this. Keep going, Thanks. sorry. Yeah, and uh, somehow um, Steely Dan made it into that video because I bought a book of um, the sheet music and looking at that sheet music just made no sense. It's hard to read. The chords are weird. And uh, I just followed that exploration and I tried one song uh, looking at the, it for a while and I realized that yeah, these are performances that were captured and uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's there. It was really very finely orchestrated, but these people came in, they rehearsed, and they performed, and uh, many thousands of people did that <laughs> in their career. So I guess I'm exploring artists I enjoyed while I was growing up. And um, so I'm seeking a certain quality, mm -hmm. and uh, there's something that has been lost, I think, or, or hard to find these days. And maybe it's from like early music, early 20th century music. Um, and I did study piano jazz in my 20s. And back then it was a very technical exercise. But now I'm looking at it as an emotional connection to really seek that, to feel the emotions as I listen to the music. And then I'm also interested in non-standard tunings because the history of uh, 440 as the standard has some interesting uh, implications. So there are things like a 432 for classical music, uh, 444, maybe a healing music and 528 other properties. People do those kinds of music. You can find them on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's like Indian raga music, that very interesting structures and also chip music. So that's where people go back to the sounds of computers from the 1980s for their favorite video games. And uh, they uh, produce it and uh, it brings back nostalgic memories for people who played those games. And uh, so, and like another related thing is uh, Jeff Raskin from Apple. Um, he uh, studied recorder music. And I like recorded music. I studied that in junior high school. So actually, I'm realizing, it, well, it's not necessary to play an instrument to make music these days because the computer could do so much for you. Um, so like I've thought in the past that maybe some performance art would be interesting. But, you know, it's hard to see where that fits in for me. And public performance, I'm limiting it just to like my synagogue band. Uh, in the synagogue and occasionally at a home for the elderly, because I've seen how um, the elderly respond to specific songs from their childhood, and it could really unlock people. And, and Parkinson's and a bunch of oh, yeah. music is magical. Yeah, the, and the therapies that are used, uh, helping people recover from addictions, uh, it really does something in the brain. It lights up a, a whole lot in the brain. So maybe so, the road to world peace is just installing speakers everywhere and forcing everybody to listen to healing music. Well, the, the right type of music. Uh, yeah, if we adjust the frequencies correctly, <laughs> then we'll all resonate. And, clearly, uh, I'm being ironic, but um, uh, <laughs> let's but, do it. <laughs> but if we could find our way to to music that works, that's uh, that's a cool thing. Uh, thanks, yeah, Eric. I, I reposted sure. I reposted the link to your oh, thank you video so that it would be closer in the in the chat. Thanks. Anything else? No, that's it. Marvelous. Um, let's go Gil, Doug, Carmichael, Carl. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. So a few comments on what's gone before and then a few updates. Um, uh, music, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk more about music some other time. Uh, or maybe let's even make music together as uh, one of the things that we do together. Um, 
Hank, to what you were saying about visualizing the world 30 years from now, it reminded me of a process that we were doing back in the nuclear freeze days of the 80s. Uh, we were doing lots of house parties uh, for a film that I was producing. And one of the things we did was invite people to visualize the world of the future. And I was stunned uh, one day where everybody in the room reported that they saw nothing, it was black. Uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, it was oh, amazing and terrifying. Shocking. Yeah, and I, and I don't think we had the good sense to drop our program and just dive into that, which is probably what we should have done. There are other yeah. people who've, who've mined that field more since then. But anyhow, just that, um, 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 which is about time, which takes me back to Klaus's uh, graph of the oh fuck timeline. Um, two thoughts there. One, Klaus, you, you, you kept talking about we, but in homage to Ken Homer, uh, we tend to use we in different ways, sometimes even in the same paragraph or sentence. Uh, and so the we is us and the we is all of humanity. And that thing is a timeline of kind of where the humanity is at any given moment. And it moves, hopefully. The proportions hopefully change over time. Um, uh, which leads me to the question of how do we talk to people who are focusing in different places or who would place themselves in different positions on that graph? Uh, you know. How do the people who are who who say fuck talk to the people who say it ain't nothing? Um, and how do we listen to each other? And you know, so <clears throat> takes me to one of the three things I want to touch on. One of the other things I want to touch on here is I th I'm thinking a lot about democracy these days uh, and fascists. I'm surprised why might that be? Um, um, and um, and the challenge of on the one hand winning political power, which we doesn't look like we're going to be doing very well at this year. Uh, and the other hand, building bridges to, you know, to somehow heal the rifts and find find ways to move the middle. Um, uh, I don't want to go into the details of the hearings this week, but I'll just say that I'm, I'm both uh, scared for the Republic and our safety. Republic and, not Republican. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and really concerned, back to what we were talking about with cancel culture at the top of the call. Uh, I'm really concerned by the tendency of the progressive side to purge its ranks and seek for purity at a time when we need majorities or effective majorities at the polls. So there's a whole conversation to do there. Uh, on, on personal front, I'm focusing as best as I can on Critical Path Capital. For those of you who are new, this is a holding company that we're standing up uh, to buy uh, small and medium-sized companies from retiring baby boomer founders. Um, climatize them, um, um, democratize them, basically produce ecologically grounded employee-owned community-rooted companies focusing on the picks and shovels of the next economy. This is not VC clean tech invention, but the things that need to get built to make the transition happen, everything from you know uh, uh, solar panel racks to wiring harnesses for cars to heat pumps to you have it. So we're, uh, we're hot on the trail of that. Um, a request out to you, and it may not be the universe, well, it's probably not the universe for many of you, but maybe there's a little thread somewhere to some uncle somewhere. We're looking for a couple of private equity renegades, um, people who have been in that world, who have chops and heart, who know how to do that thing, but want to do something different with those Didn't talents. Didn't they hire for those, the opposite of those traits, but for the heart part? Well, that's why I think there's some renegades who've been been there and said, I'm fed up with this. I want to do something I really care about and I have skills. Mm -hmm. So I'm offering those. So folks you want a recovering private equity person? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm using renegades because it sounds more fun than, than recovering. It does. Uh, but yeah, that. Maverick. Maverick is fine. Yeah. Uh, Maverick is just, Maverick is a guy though. Re Renegade is a quality. Oh, interesting. Good. I like that. Maverick was some dude who refused to brand his cattle. So that's another story. So anyhow, so folks who have been in that world who want to do something for the what we all here care about, who are in the fuck zone of the chart and so forth. Um, um, we're on the trail of some really interesting analytics of how to understand what our markets and market potentials are. Marshall, if you're still here, I'd love to talk. I guess, are you gone? I'd love to talk with you about some of the stuff that you're doing. Um, spent a, a, an hour yesterday talking with, hi Marshall, with a guy who's doing some very interesting um, database and web scraping to identify business patterns and where the opportunities might be of, you know, where do we find the companies that we want to focus on? Um, so uh, Marshall, I'd like to talk with you and those of you who play that sort of game. Jerry, I'm, I'm thinking back of your past life 
in industry analysis, uh, there's a conversation for us to have too. So I'm having a blast. I'm in territory that I've never lived in before. I am just thrilled in every conversation. I'm learning a lot. The, th the, the offer that we're developing makes a lot of sense. Um, we're juggling the kind of, it's, it's a chicken and egg in three dimensions. It's a, a team and money and pipeline. And so we're sort of pushing on all three fronts. The first one that pops, the other two will pop very quickly. I'm pretty sure. So that's uh, that's my report today. Thanks, Gil. Sounds great. Sounds like you might have rung Marshall's bell. Marshall, do you want to jump in for a moment and ask a question or? Nope. Just shared my contact info. Gil yep. or others, happy to chat. Thanks. Fabulous. And I threw you a LinkedIn uh, thing. Thank you. Fabulous. Thanks, Gil. Uh, let's go, uh, Doug C., Carl, John. So what's been on my mind this last week that's been new for me is looking at increasingly the tension between Russia and the West and Europe, uh, motivated in part by the withholding of the grain, which is going to create chaos around the world and probably not tolerated by everybody. So it leads to uh, the, an increasing probability of, of a serious war between the West and Russia. Uh, and um, I've been looking at it quite a bit and in a lot of conversations, and it just looks rather terrifying on top of what we already had with cascading failures around uh, the economy, agriculture, uh, politics, income inequality, and so on. Um, thanks, Doug. Um, who in any of our radars has a good grasp of the logistics, economics, uh, fallout of Russia's capture of Ukraine's grain, et cetera, and, uh, plus, you know, added on to these other kinds of effects? Have you found anybody or has anybody else found anybody uh, who is really like on this trail and with trustworthy information? Gil? There's some pretty good discussions in Twitter. Uh, um, can you, can you, do you remember who? So uh, uh, O'Brien would be uh -huh. one person. Cool. There are others. Thank you. Uh, uh, Gil is recommending Peter Zion. Yeah. Uh, uh, Zion um, does a very uh, ge uh, interesting geopolitical analysis with a lot of emphasis on the geo, on geography. Uh, and resources and rivers and uh, and such, uh, as well as uh, economic history and cultural history and so forth. Uh, pretty interesting guy. In fact, his thing is called Zihan on Geopolitics. There you go. Uh, uh, a new book just dropped this week called The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Uh, here it is. The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. Mm -hmm. um, Interesting guy who's been on a couple of different calls about the current situation. Very interesting to follow. And here's his Twitter account. I'll post it in, in the chat. Yeah, good. Um, thank you. So let's go. Lovely glimpse. That was a lovely glimpse of the power of your brain. <laughs> thank, thank you. So when you, I just got to say, when you're adding to the same place over and over again, it, it accretes. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's like, if, and if you don't fuck it up by letting it run wild, uh, it's actually useful. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, Carl, John, Mark. Back to you, Carl. Yeah, you... That's, uh, yeah I've, been, um, I've been using the brain since 1998, meeting Harlan at a conference and stuff. So the scalability question is always, that's been one you get the the um redundancy versus like if you want to share it with the smaller group of people too and that so i i got some i mean it's fundamental things on my mind the, the believing game is needed which i um also see linked to um, the six thinking hats the the yellow hat thinking so it's, uh, um, so I've been trying to make some traction there. And then it, the whole issue of trust and can we have um, really getting groups talking and some of it can't be recorded. 
and stuff. You can't trust anonymous and, um, and things along those lines. So that's where my thoughts are right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, let's go John, Mark, Doug Breitbart. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Jerry. I, I've been away quite a bit um, and, you know, distracted by some things that are not on the face of it, OGM, but, you know, we, we're dealing with life and death, you know, from a, from a little bit of a remove. We, we think it's actually, we, I say OGM, we think it's closer than most of our, most than mainstream folks think, and that's why we're reacting the way we do. But in my case, it's getting very close. Uh, my sister is going into hospice today. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. been distracting me. It's actually, it's not, in a way, it's not as bad as it sounds because the the really terrible thing would have been if she had gone in a week ago when she really was not herself and really not, would not understand what was going on. But there are signs that she does understand what's going on and we're, we're following her five wishes and we're doing all this stuff. And there's a huge backlog of people who know her because of her work as a nurse and her work in Rwanda. So she's in the VNA hospice facility and they all say, oh yeah, we know Mary Jo, we're, we're fine. We're, you know, we'll take really good care of her. So there's actually good stuff inside the, the common situation that we all face, which is, you know, eventually we're dying and this is happening for her probably in the next one to three months. So uh, that has been distracting. Nonetheless, I really appreciated this conversation today and the, the richness of it. You know, there have been times when I've thought, you know, we're just spinning, we're just talking. But um, I, the, the, the density of the connections that people are making uh, to information as, as a essential precursor to action uh, is, is really good. And, uh, and it is an essential precursor. It's, it's much better that we try to encompass, try to, you know, find the blue swans, then that we just go out and act, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, restored in a way uh, by this conversation today. And I, I appreciate it uh, very much. And um, I'll, be, I'll be back. I'll be probably uh, going to see my sister. Uh, she's down in Santa Barbara. I've, I've been there. I'm probably going to go back again pretty soon. But anyway, really appreciate this group. Thank you. John, um, thank you. My heart is with you and your sister and your family. Um, let's just go into silence for a second to appreciate what you said and to think about the situation that you and your family are in. Thank you. Um, let's go, John, Mark, Doug Breitbart. Uh, sorry, Mark, Doug Breitbart, then Michael, then me. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jerry. Um, John, um, yeah, my heart goes out to you. I'm uh, sorry you're going through this, and of course, um, more for your sister, but uh, good luck. I hope uh, peace comes. Uh, um, as it, as it will, but uh, um, in the moment, it's really, really tough. Um, I am um, working at the uh, Internet Archive. Um, I just posted a uh, um, kind of biological foundation of values. And I, I was amazed that uh, um, the coding search site um, uh, Stack Overflow or was it? No, I think it was a different one. Anyway, I, I just saw a, uh, you know, a thumbs up, you know, meh, um, thumbs down. And I think that that middle value, this doesn't apply to me. You know, this is, 
outside my umwelt. You know, I don't, I don't register this is, is a very important um, point on, on the scale of the foundation of values. Mark, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not clear what you mean. Um, can you like unpack it a little bit? Sure. Um, if you're an organism in the environment, um, there are features in the environment that you don't notice. As a human, we don't notice ultraviolet light, but the bees are like, see a target at, a, at the middle of the sunflower. Um, and so, you know, the sunflower does not apply to you in terms of food, unless you're in the sunflower seeds or, you know, <laughs> or you're near sunflowers. If uh, um, there are no sunflowers in the state of Oregon, it, it, it also doesn't apply. Um, but uh, this wacky bunch of Catholic theologians at, uh, I was going to type it in, um, lyceum.institute. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. You've been doing work with them. Yeah, I've been, I've been uh, uh, studying with them on, uh, you know, basically reintegrating into the culture the real post-modernity, which is going past uh, modernity rather than what uh, is called postmodern in philosophy right now, which is really an ultra concentrated form of modernity. But going back to the notion that the human brain is not for intelligence, it's for experiencing. And when we basically cut off, you know, this feeling part of thinking, um, we're really kind of um, breaking the system that is um, humanity. And, uh, and and biology. Um, I'm not a big fan of AI, but um, I am a big fan of uh, um, Mike. Uh, Jerry, were you able to connect with uh, um, Bob Stein? Um, no, totally fell off my agenda, and I need to contact him. Thank you for reminding me. I'm, I apologize. That's okay. Uh, I've fallen off the radar of uh, OGM, and what brought me to OGM was an open global mind and uh, Eric we need to talk um it's just and Pete and <laughs> Doug but um hey um what did Stuart Brand said uh time is only a resource because it limits our transactions and that's another value um we are limited and we have constraints and we have constraints on constraints. Anyway, um, what we're doing is uh, with Bob Stein creating this notion of tapestry and I am pushing for uh, protocol, not product, but basically taking uh, the links of the web and rather than having a uh, text that's underlined blue, you basically have a picture of where you're going, a website, um, you know, the, the album cover, um, what have you, and basically making a more visually distributed um, uh, way of linking uh, sites together. And I am uh, studying um, something called lit.dev. Uh, I can type that in, or somebody else can type in lit.dev, but basically, um, oh, there we go, lit.dev, which did not turn into a link. Um, but basically it is a <laughs> standard of web components um, it is a, um, you know, basically a web standards standard um, where basically we might be able to create a declarative way of creating something like the brain so that you can take a topic and basically create a map, a mind map in what would basically be HTML. Say um, what? Yeah, so um, that's, um, I, I hope to reconnect with um, the parts of OGM, which are about um, mind mapping and, and shared thinking and, uh, you know, of, you know, it's been noted, you know, whenever people get together to uh, talk about collaboration, they turn out to be the least collaborative people you've ever met. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> that's a reality that uh, you know we we all have to struggle with and and try to find out you know what is um, you know collaboration and and you know there's politics and it's it's definitely tough. I wish my job was more about collaboration than it was about sticking my head my face into a keyboard and a screen for many hours a day. But um, 
Uh, that's that's the basics. I'll, I'll cut it short. Um, uh, but we're really trying to make the web better. And uh, there's a D web camp coming up, uh, which is going to be uh, an amazing meeting of people in August. Um, I think get dweb.com possibly. Um, but uh, basically, um, we're also have for anybody in San Francisco and Jerry, you know, come down and visit. Uh, we have uh, Friday lunches that people show up at and um, those are uh, open invitations, but uh, email the uh, Internet Archive first um, to uh, show up a little afternoon on Fridays. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. That's awesome. Um, love that. Uh, we're near the end of our time. Uh, let's go to uh, Doug B, Michael, and then maybe me if we have time, but go take it away. Um, so my, uh, I guess my, my primary focus for the last 18 to 24 months has been working with Tina Gotterman on um, bringing the five elements, ancient five elements, Himalayan Buddhist uh, wisdom and tradition to application. Um, so it sort of provides a, a plug and play for um, getting arms around all the soft stuff, the human, what's the human beingness part in humans doing together, co-creating together. And uh, um, it's providing a way of seeing and reading, feeling, sensing into um, what's needed. The, the thing about the elements and the natural world is that imbalance uh, and the addressing of it is never about taking anything away. It's always about what's missing, what's needed to bring it back into balance. So it's always additive. And uh, the five elements can be really handy uh, in clarifying and answering the question, what's needed? And Klaus, your, your call to action is something that rings loud for me. I come at all of this from the other end of the telescope, which is, um, is there a way to catalyze um, that blue, what was the reference, blue swan. swan. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way of doing that um, with values, good intention, and in service to uh, on a massive scale? Um, and that somehow the magic in that has to do with the uh, spiritual and emotional and um, uh, and, and physical dimensions um, of human beings, uh, not the intellectual so much. Um, and I guess the last tidbit, uh, on all the reference to music in an elemental frame, um, music is actually a sensorial channel closest to space, closest to the divine, to source. So um, that's sort of um, at the heart of its power and its energy, its appeal, its draw, um, because we actually reconnect on a felt, felt sense level um, with everything that we're connected to, in fact. So just offer that as a, as a contribution. Thanks, Doug. Um, as I typed in the chat, I've got a bounce uh if there are any, any any comments on that but i'll pass the con to pete and um see y'all next uh next thursday michael <laughs> wait waiting for my uh my, my benediction by pete as new host so <laughs> um i uh I'm, I'm hearing elements of um, particularly what Mark said and, uh, and, and, and in things that Marshall was talking about and Jerry and Gil and really everybody here at one time or another. 
um, <clears throat> that that speak to um, my like ongoing efforts to uh, collect and connect all kinds of things, whether it's um, bits of knowledge, um, people, uh, objects, um, and we have so much stuff that's so rich and the, the, the challenges in collaboration, you know, it's really interesting when I look at something like Lit um, or, you know, hear Marshall talking about what he's up to or, you know, the internet, think about the internet archive. There's all this, um, and factor, there's all this collecting, you know, going on and trying to figure out how to connect what you've collected, you know, Jerry's brain as well. Um, and then connect the connections that the collectors have collected. And that's where the collaboration breaks down. You know, it's the, the interoperability of all the actions that we all we know we all need to take and we're taking individually. And, you know, Scott was saying, you know, it's, it's decide what you're gonna do, separate, you know, get back together, separate, get back together. And that getting together and, and building interoperability and building systems that people who are not part of can fall into um, and uh, one <laughs> tangentially, um, one one thing, one place that it's easy in a way um, is with objects and and Gil, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of boomers a lot. Um, uh, I'm both in my own life um, through the mortality of family and friends um, and, and in my experiences in, in talking to other people, um, running up against a lot of people who have gathered um, physical manifestations of their knowledge and art and um, you know, cur curational skill and where do those go when they don't have time for them, a place for them, space for them, offspring who want to carry that on? And so much is lost. So much is, even if it doesn't end up in landfill, and often it ends up in landfill, it doesn't find its connection to, to people who will appreciate it. And the knowledge that went along with it can't, it can't be tagged with that and live on. Um, past a person. So uh, I'm actually in conversations with some people about building some, some structures around that um, that would be, certainly could be for profit, but trying to figure out some way of, of doing it in a, in a co-opt way that you know, lives between 1-800-JUNK and, uh, you know, people who have collections that are recognized enough to put up to auction at Christie's. Um, and, you know, their, their existing state sale entities and, and ways to donate stuff to the Internet Archive. But, you know, having, having uh, a network of experts who um, can can shepherd the things that we all leave behind and say, you know, this, this needs to go to the Internet Archive. This needs to be composted because it's compostable. This needs to be, you know, this is, has value to collectors um, to shepherd that stuff and not, not just do the most expedient thing. I mean, I've looked at the models that estate sales have where they basically say, OK, you know, we'll give you um, 90 percent of all the stuff of, of the cash we can generate from the stuff that we can sell from for over a thousand dollars but you know and then it scales down to you know if it's if it's inexpensive and not you know easiest for us to just 
donate to Goodwill, you know, you're not going to get anything, but we're not going to go and find the optimal place for it to go. Um, so I'm thinking about that a lot with physical objects. I'm thinking about that uh, with regard to knowledge too, and, and really excited to talk to each of you and just continuing my quest to connect the collectors um, and my wish that somebody with more uh, technological chops than me um, would, would um, share with all of us the, the keys to interoperability on that. So that's a little brain dump. Working on it, thanks. <laughs> thanks, <I> Michael. <laughs> in, the, in the limited time that I have, it's just like all meetings yesterday. It's just, oh my God. Um, and uh, yeah, got to write code too. Aye, aye, aye. It's been a fun call, folks. Keep going. Sorry, I just want to say one thing. I, want, yep. I just want to cut in with one thing. If I can manage to turn my background off, just to answer uh, um, Carl on saying, what about books? Um, let's see. Um, yes, indeed. What about books? <laughs> so I'm hearing you. I'm, I'm working on it. Love to talk to you about it, Carl. Okay. If you know how many a... books you have, you don't have enough. What's that? <laughs> if, you, if you know how many books you have, you don't have enough. Yeah, Michael, Michael or Mark should mention that Internet Archive loves to receive books and digitize them. Uh, and you still have access to them, but you don't have to fill up your house with them. So that's an option for everybody. I've done a, a stack of shipments to them and we'll do another round soon. Yeah. It, it takes a lot of time to get them uh, packaged, shipped to the Philippines, digitized and online. But but basically, uh, yeah, it's, it's not so that we can digitize it and ship the books back to you, unfortunately. Uh, we got to keep them to have a digital or to have a physical copy in order to lend them out. And Kevin. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I'm not here late. I've been in Tupelo for the last three or four days. My sister-in-law got a bad case of COVID and she had nobody to sit with her. So my son and I were there and we're finally uh, leaving Tupelo where it's a hundred and, no, it's only 97 degrees. And, and the humidity is not, you know, it can get super saturated here. So you can get 101 or 2 percent humidity because the air just holds more. Wow! But it's not that way today. So, but anyway, I'm, as always in the summer, I'm glad to leave Mississippi. Uh, we start our serious wireframes on our for-profit multi-donor marketplace and a for-profit crowdfunding equity marketplace tomorrow. So that's pretty fun. And we're also uh, calling in a friend because we have a piece of IP anybody who knows more about this than I do, that is replicable across these things, uh, our equity fund, et cetera. Uh, and we're calling in a friend who's, who's had that kind of consulting practice. But if anybody has a magic sauce IP consulting practice in your history, if you could reach out to me, that'd be great. I, I've, never, I've never done one. And uh, we have something, we don't know how to price it. We don't know. Well, and, and we don't know consulting delivery and, and, and there's a million things we don't know <laughs> we don't know anything about it um so anyway if anybody has has that kind of expertise because we, we have some things that people will want and they'll want our method of doing it so we have to figure that out uh i i could talk, talk to you a bit about that kevin uh uh, the, right. uh, the normal way to do it is is to have either your internal consultants or you know aligned external consultants <laughs> trained on the IP and then you don't actually sell the IP you sell the, the, the consulting yeah that's that's okay if you have a link you can shoot me in by email or whatever I'm on a phone right now because we're yep driving through Mississippi that'd be great uh, so thank you yeah the other side of that, Kevin, is that if you, it, 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 you're not going to have as wide a reach probably if it just goes through your own consultants. So licensing it out may be an option to consider, but then you have the question of, of training and quality control and so forth. But we're Yeah. 
Yeah. I in yeah, in that I case, that. I I wouldn't license the IP. I'd license the you know I I would have a, a approved uh, consultants that have access to the IP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's those are good ways to look at going forward. Thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Good stuff. Thanks. Thanks all. We'll okay. see you around. Thank you.